All right. Uh, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to all our speakers and our viewers jo joining us online. My name is Russell Shell. I am the Executive Director of the Global Taiwan Institute. GTI is a 501c3 think tank dedicated exclusively to Taiwan policy research and related programs. Our mission is to enhance the relationship between the United States and Taiwan and Taiwan with the world by contributing to a more informed policy discussion about Taiwan. In pursuit of that mission, we undertake several major programs. They include a biweekly publication called the Global Taiwan Brief, where we feature timely analysis and informed opinions about Taiwan. We also organize regular public seminars, like the virtual seminar that you are, are participating in today, where we uh, invite expert commentators and informed uh, influencers um, uh, on policy issues related uh, to Taiwan. We also organize an annual symposium, uh, usually in the fall, uh, where we invite leading policymakers and scholars uh, and thinkers about US-Taiwan relations uh, to really discuss the past, present, and future of this critical bilateral relationship. Uh, in addition to these uh, policy research and, uh, and events, uh, we also provide um, uh, scholarships for uh, scholars as well as uh, young academics uh, and creative thinkers who are interested to perform short-term field research in Taiwan. Uh, this opportunity also affords Taiwanese researchers uh, as well uh, to come to the United States for short-term field research. Uh, in addition to these programs, we also have uh, regular uh, cultural programs. Uh, so stay tuned for some events that we will have uh, later this year um, featuring films from Taiwan. Uh, of course, uh, I would be remiss if uh, we began today's program uh, if I did not uh, thank our co-founders, our, our board members, uh, our advisors, and the staff and interns that make all our programs possible. If you're not already subscribed to receive all our updates, you may do so uh, by visiting our website at www.globaltaiwan.org. So let's start today's program. Amid the novel coronavirus pandemic, the world order is experiencing unprecedented disruption. The transatlantic relationship between the United States and Europe has been a vital foundation of an international system built after World War II and the Cold War that is coming increasingly under strain due to the rise of authoritarian revisionist powers and increasing strategic competition between two vastly different systems. Indeed, CCP General Secretary Xi Jinping sees a struggle between the Chinese and Western systems. General Secretary Xi has made this point abundantly clear in his very first speech to the CCP Politburo in January 2013, where he states, most importantly, we must concentrate our efforts on building a socialism that is superior to capitalism and laying the foundation for a future where we will win the initiative and have the dominant position. Despite a broad and deeply shared commitment to human rights and democratic values, as well as interest in maintaining the rule rules-based world order, the United States and Europe have been unable to translate overlapping policy goals to collaborate effectively on foreign policy initiatives. This is happening against the backdrop of an increasingly aggressive People's Republic of China, both regionally and globally, as clearly exhibited by Beijing's heavy-handed approach to the Hong Kong protests, its military activities in the South China Sea and East China Sea, debt trap financing, and its so-called wolf warrior diplomacy worldwide. The most recent U.S. national security strategy released in 2017 clearly recognizes these challenges and underscores a return to great power competition between the United States and China. For its part, Europe appears to be taking a harder look at China. The European Commission and its EU-China a strategic outlook labeled China a systemic rival and senior US, EU diplomats have accused China of waging a pandemic disinformation campaign. For Taiwan, Beijing's aggression has always been an existential matter. In the last four years, China has significantly ramped up its multifaceted pressure campaign on Taipei in an effort to coerce the democratically elected leaders to bow to Beijing's demands for cross-strait negotiations. 
Taipei success in handling COVID-19, in which the original epicenter was in Wuhan in China, have helped to highlight the successes of a democratic model in the face of China's authoritarian model. And by extension, this democratic model is also the free and open model that forms the foundation of the existing rule-based system. In a way, the preservation of Taiwan's democracy and freedom is part and parcel of the preservation of the existing order. If the United States and Europe are to effectively safeguard Taiwan's de facto independence and freedom and maintaining the rules-based order, overcoming their differences and moving toward a truly transatlantic approach to cross strait relations should be necessary. This timely virtual seminar will examine the opportunities as well as the challenges for such an approach. Incorporating voices from the United States, Europe, and Taiwan for really GTI's most global discussion to date. The timeliness of our discussion is only surpassed by the fact that as we speak now, the U.S. National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien and Deputy National Security Advisor Matt Ponder are in Europe for a three-day three trip to meet with European officials on China. The countries on the itinerary reportedly include the United Kingdom, France, Germany, and Italy. Hopefully they or their staff will hear some of our discussions here today to help inform their discussions. And to provide insights on all these issues and more, we have truly an excellent panel of experts and whom I will briefly introduce here. First, we have Robert Wong, who is a senior associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and an adjunct professor at the Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. Robert was a career foreign service officer in the U.S. Department of State and he served as senior U.S. official for APACT, as well as the deputy chief of mission at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing, as well as the deputy director of the American Institute in Taiwan. Next, we have Ambassador Michael Rowley, who is a former career diplomat with over 30 years experience, principally handling UK policy towards East and Southeast Asia. Ambassador Rowley's final foreign and Commonwealth office appointment was as director of the British Trade and Cultural Office in Taipei. Um, who is the essentially the British de facto British ambassador to Taiwan? And upon leaving Taiwan, he joined BAE Systems initially as director Far East, responsible for strategic advice on the company's business development. Next, we have Teresa Fallon, who is the founder and the director of the Center for Russia, Europe, Asia Studies in Brussels. She's concurrently a member of the Council for Security Cooperation in the Asia Pacific a non-resident senior fellow of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, an adjunct professor at the George Marshall European Center for Security Studies, uh, and a member of the CEPS CEPS Task Force on AI and Cybersecurity. Last but not least, we have uh, Dr. Lai Yizong, who is the president of the Prospect Foundation, a Taiwan-based think tank. Prior to joining the Prospect Foundation, he held several prominent positions within the Democratic Progressive Party, serving as executive director of the DPP mission uh, to the United States and as director general of the Department of International Affairs. He has also worked as special assistant with the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office in Tokyo. I'll just add at this point right now that, um, that both Michael and Bob are advisors to GTI. Now the panelists will provide opening comments for about 10 minutes, minutes each. Uh, following everyone's comments, I will facilitate a discussion by posing a few questions to all our speakers. And then we'll close around uh, 15 minutes at the end of the session for audience Q&A. Audience members may present your questions by either using the chat function uh, on YouTube or by sending an email to contact at globaltaiwan.org. Please remember to include your name as well as your affiliation when, uh, when asking your questions. Uh, without further ado, then, uh, let me turn the floor over to uh, Robert Wong, who will provide us with uh, his U.S. perspective on transatlantic approach to cross-strait relations. Over to you, Bob. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Russell. And uh, also, uh, just want to say I'll, I'll make my comments uh, short and brief, uh, but I just want to say uh, hi to all my uh, good friends there. And uh, and of course, uh, first time to see Teresa. Draw virtually. Um, 
Let me make it uh, fairly short. I think uh, Russell has already talked about uh, why I think this might be a good time for transatlantic cooperation uh, in terms of responding to China. Uh, Russell went through the list of what China has been doing over the last decade, uh, the last uh, four or five years, uh, as well as uh, you know what's has done, I think, during the coronavirus pandemic uh, around the world, being more globally sort of uh, challenging uh, in terms of its disinformation campaign in Europe. So what China has essentially done really is over the last 10 years, and again, in particular, the last four or five years, is really to raise the awareness of the world about what China's challenge means to the world. Uh, before that, you had Deng Xiaoping's hide and hide, but now it's very clear. So I think the US perhaps came to this understanding a little bit earlier, but I clearly, uh, based on what Russell say and said, I think Michael and Teresa and others will talk about uh, this recognition of China's, and let me put it very bluntly, uh, threat and potential threat uh, to the uh, the interests, uh, the economic interests, uh, especially in the technology sector, but also to the values of the um, uh, post-war uh, global rules-based economic uh, order and liberal order. So I think it, the 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 fact more people are waking up, wake, awakening to this challenge means that I think uh, it's it's time now for a transatlantic uh, response, a more coherent and cohesive response to uh, China, and additionally to cross-strait relations. Because at the same time, not only is there more recognition of what China stands for, what the challenge is, uh, when, when I say China, by the way, I mean the Communist Party regime in China, not Chinese as a whole. So I want to make that very clear. Uh, but at the same time, what has happened is that I think it has also highlighted a Taiwan's position in Asia, Taiwan's vibrant democracy in the recent election, uh, Taiwan's, uh, I think, strong and capable handling of the coronavirus pandemic, uh, Taiwan's economic technology position in the, in the global regional supply chain, uh, and many other things. And so I think it's 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 uh, done that, and I think this therefore is the uh, I think is is the right time, the right opportunity to try to uh, put together a response to China and uh, on cross trade relations. Um, and you know, now having said that, I think uh, at the same time, I, I think we're all aware of the challenges. Uh, the first challenge, obviously, is transatlantic relations, um, which hasn't been great uh, under the Trump administration. Uh, especially given his focus on investment issues with Europe, uh, his position on NATO and so on and so forth. So in any case, we've had a lot of problems. So I'm really happy to see the fact that we're now sending people. Uh, Pompeo, of course, has been there. Secretary of State Pompeo has been to Europe several times. Now, I think pushing harder to try to get a more cohesive response uh, with our European friends. Um, but Beyond that, I think uh, I think um, Russell pointed out earlier, there are also you know, many different European countries. I mean, there are 27 EU members, uh, all with their different national interests. A lot of them have very strong economic ties or dependence on, on China. Uh, and so you're not going to be able to get a very cohesive, I think, uh, response with everybody, all 27 EU members, with the United States, and even the US, there are different opinions on this. And so you're not going to be able to get a very strong, cohesive response in a very formal sense. So uh, to cut to the chase, I think what I would propose essentially is that, and again, my views are not a U.S. view, to, to make it very clear, just my own views uh, sitting here in the U.S., but it's, they're my own views. And uh, my, my own view is basically that we should try to simply increase coordination as I and Matt Pottinger simply increase coordination with our European friends, uh, whichever countries, our like-minded countries, like-minded governments, uh, to try to see if we can somehow get our policies in sync. Again, it doesn't have to be a formal alliance, doesn't have to be a coalition, uh, doesn't have to involve all EU members, but just to sort of coordinate with each other on what we're doing individually, separately, and hopefully then get a more uh, coherent 
response, I think, to uh, the challenge from China and uh, on cross-strait relations. So uh, in this area then, uh, make it very quick, uh, I have some ideas, for example, uh, initially, um, I think, as, as I think most of you know, we've had several legislation passed in Congress urging the president to do different things. Uh, these include um, what uh, Taiwan Travel Act in 2018, Asia Reassurance Act, uh, Initiative Act, and most recently, of course, the Taipei Act, uh, Ta the Taiwan um, Alliance International Protection Enhancement Initiative Act. Before, before I got on this. Um, but so we've had several acts that are encouraging, for example, to begin with, I think more high level visits from the US uh, executive branch and others to Taiwan. And I think that's a great idea. I think that uh, we ought to, uh, I think the executive, the uh, White House needs to start acting on it at the cabinet level, if possible. Uh, and of course, on the European side, I'll leave it to Teresa to, to discuss more, but we also have there uh, at this point, I think in June, the formation of a, um, what is it called? The International Parliamentary Alliance on China that not only includes EU, I mean, um, European members, but also Japan and Australia. And the idea then is to somehow put things together and uh, with all of us, I think, try to increase our contact and expand our relationship with Taiwan. Uh, and of course you want, if possible, we want to make sure that we have something substantive beyond the symbolic nature of it, uh, beyond the fact that we're to squeeze Taiwan uh, international space, uh, this itself will be important. But beyond that, I think we could, if we could include uh, some substantive uh, uh, content. Uh, and one thing I think that jumps to mind right away, of course, would be perhaps cooperation on public health. Uh, especially in light of, in wake of the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic, how Taiwan has handled it, how it's been kept out of WHO. And I think the US and I think hopefully Europe and others will also be able to uh, try to expand cooperation with Taiwan in this area in a substantive way uh, with visits to Taiwan, establishing offices perhaps. I would think, I would suggest we establish, for example, a CDC office in, in, at AIT uh, as an example only. so that we can prepare in our own interest for the next pandemic that might again start in, in China. And I think working with Taiwan in this area would be of benefit to uh, both Europe and the United States. And finally, I think in terms of what's happened recently, I think there's more recognition that there needs to be more diversification of the global regional supply chain uh, in, in Asia in particular, and Taiwan plays a critical role. Now, we're not, I'm not talking here about decoupling. I'm just talking here about diversifying it so that we don't have to be subjected to the, uh, the leverage that China oftentimes uses uh, against both European countries and the United States. And finally, uh, just one last thing. I know the time is running out. Um, with, with, I've worked, uh, explored this with Lai Yi Drone before. And I think in the non-governmental sector, I think, I think it would be very useful for Europe and the United States being very strong on NGOs, civil society, democracy, to really try to get our NGOs to work more closely and then move from that to perhaps use Taiwan as a way to uh, promote democracy and civil society in Asia as a whole. That's it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, I think you know, made some excellent points uh, in your presentation. Uh, I think the one on the need for increased coordination between the United States and European country is, uh, is absolutely critical. But of course, that is where a lot of the challenges also lies, is how do you increase coordination with such a diverse body and, and with varying interests, as you uh, uh, noted. Um, I think the point, you know, especially I think I would just like to highlight you know the the, the point about uh, the uh, for more high level visits is 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 very well uh, I think taken I mean I think the, the the United States and various European capitals can I think coordinate and better coordinate on that without really you know without there being I think really divergent uh, and substantive differences on on the need for that and 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 that could be done you know I think uh, read, uh, a, a quickly and and. Um, and that would, I think, help to really, I think, underscore, I think, the, the support 
of the, the of the free and democratic community for for what Taiwan has done you know, during the um, during the uh, in, in response to the, the the Corona pandemic and uh, you know this sort of uh, and now there that there seems to be this some sense in the international community of of, of acknowledgement or recognition of a, of a of a China model for their you know, sort of ruthless sort of handling of 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 the of the response and. And there's this, and there is this competition of the model, and, and I think Taiwan stands as a very great contrast to to that uh, model that um, that I think you know uh, the international community can help support by you know, again doing more high level visits to to, to Taiwan. Um, okay, next uh, let's turn it over, uh, turn the floor over to Michael Riley, um, who will provide us with a UK perspective on a transatlantic approach to cross strait relation. Over to you, Michael. Uh, thank you, Russell, and good day, everybody. And greetings to uh, friends, former colleagues, and uh, those listening. Um, in, if I'm going to be really brief, I would say that I've heard nothing yet with which I would disagree at all. Um, if we're going to have a transatlantic approach, I think that this is probably the best time in the last 70 years to work for it, for at least three reasons. I mean, Attitudes in Europe are probably now, I would say, towards China, are probably at the lowest level since the Tiananmen Square massacre in 1989, if indeed not earlier. Um, but the reasons for the changes in attitude will be familiar. Growing recognition that far from this sort of ideal that was nurturing the West for 40 odd years, that China will gradually converge. There's this awareness that at least under Xi Jinping, China is increasingly a threat. Um, as you said, the European Union has now branded it a systemic rival. Secondly, until now, Europe has been able to take uh, what I might call a middle of the road position. It's avoided, it's wanted to avoid having to take sides between the USA and China. And it's not alone in that. China's neighbors have been similar. But under the current US administration, it's under more and more pressure to take sides on China. And if it's forced to choose, I don't think there's any doubt which side Europe's going to take. The transatlantic relationship is a bedrock of European security. We share values with the US, human rights, dignity, the rule of law that we don't share with China, and even our long-term interests fundamentally lie across the Atlantic. And, and the third factor, as Russell said in, in your introduction, recent Chinese behavior, the way they have misused the pandemic to try to make fairly cross propaganda has actually been counterproductive. Um, a lot of the protective equipment that they donated to Europe was found to be unsuitable. Other stuff was sold at inflated prices. Uh, a constructive letter from EU ambassadors in Beijing suggesting cooperation was crudely censored by the China Daily because it mentioned the origins of the pandemic in Wuhan. So we've had the UK Foreign Secretary saying there can be no return to business as usual. And that was the general situation before China then imposed the national security law on Hong Kong. And I think at least in the UK, but for a lot of people in Europe more generally, in many ways that's been not quite the final straw, but it's been the real game changer on top of everything else. China has now been seen to just casually ignore an international treaty that it had freely signed up to. So the potential for cooperation ought to be significant, but the challenges are at least as significant. The first one is that the, from Taiwan's perspective, these opportunities, if you like, are all basically negatives. There are reasons to be tough on China. None of them, none of them are positive reasons for Europe to be more supportive of Taiwan, which still struggles to get onto the radar screens here. As a very recent example, Taiwan's not on the EU's list of COVID-related safe travel destinations, even though we know that it's handling of the pandemic has been exemplary. Its rate, incidence rate has been one of the lowest anywhere. Secondly, um, the initiative for a strategic new coordinated transatlantic approach realistically would have to come from the USA. That's the reality of seven, 70 years of American leadership of the free world, its leadership of NATO, 
its security role in East Asia. Even under an internationalist president, that would require a major effort. But under the current one, as, as Bob has just said, transatlantic relations are not good. So it's good that there are now people here in Europe. Pompeo was in London earlier in the year. There is a dialogue going on. But if you actually want to get something more strategic and coordinated, um, it needs more than that. Um, a third challenge is that the EU doesn't, if you like, do hard security. Uh, that's the remit of NATO, the Western European Union. So there could be no question of an EU-US security approach. On the other hand, the EU is a major player in international trade agreements. But again, we see the Trump administration seems not to like multilateral trade agreements. It prefers bilateral ones. If we put all that to one side, the UK might be expected to be seen as a European country most likely to respond positively to, if there was to be a US initiative. Um, Trump makes no secret or, or has said publicly he, he admires Johnson, it's reciprocated. Um, the UK is no longer in the EU. British politicians regularly talk up the special relationship with the USA. But a note of caution that on China, the UK has actually got a long history of pursuing its own interests. And to give just two recent examples, under the Obama administration, it ignored American opposition to, in its desire to be the first Western country to join China's Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. More recently, at the start of this year, it ignored US lobbying and specifically allowed the use of Huawei equipment in its 5G program. Although, as of today, that position has changed and it's going to be phased out. Um, which leads me on to the question of Brexit, because there have been some observers here, mainly Conservative MPs, who have suggested that Brexit will offer or could offer opportunities to develop UK-Taiwan relations. Um, sadly, perhaps, I think that's actually unlikely. Firstly, because in the past, whenever the UK has been worried about uh, developments in Hong Kong, it's tended to become even more cautious about its engagement with Taiwan for fear that that would just create a, another unnecessary irritant in its relations with China. Now, the situation is a bit different. Hong Kong is now part of China, but the UK, if not China, is still conscious of its obligations under the uh, joint declaration. It's possible that this time things will be different, but I think it's too early to tell, and I would therefore inject a note of caution. Secondly, the previous UK government, but the same political persuasion, had made clear that a post-Brexit priority for the UK would be a free trade, trying to get a free trade agreement with China. I think that's likely to change in the current circumstances, but not to the extent that I think a UK government would be willing to contemplate uh, a trade agreement with Taiwan. It'll want to keep the door open to China in the hope that relations improve. And even if it doesn't, uh, realistically, there are 16 odd countries with whom we do more trade than with Taiwan. They will be the priorities and there's just limited negotiating capacity. So it'll be some years before we get to that. Having, all that, having said all that, undoubtedly, we do need badly a coordinated strategic approach to cross straits. But because there are so many other pressing issues, pandemic, um, Brexit for the UK, other things, I think getting that in the near future is unlikely. But nonetheless, and this is following on from what Bob said, there are still practical steps that I think could be taken that would make a difference. I said the EU is not involved in security matters. But on the other hand, both France and the UK have increased freedom of navigation passages through the South China Sea in the last two or three years. If there was to be a more formal transatlantic approach on those, it would be modest, but it would still send a very clear signal. And related to that, it's widely expected here that later in the year, the UK government will announce an increased security presence in East Asia. It's likely to be token rather than substantive, a small deployment of Marines, something like that. But it's still an opportunity to present a coordinated approach. The big question about it for now is whether it will be sustained. 
is actually just doing this runs completely counter to the UK's defence policy for the last 50 years, which has been to called withdraw from east of Suez. So the more that this new deployment and these new activities can be, can be coordinated with the US, with France, and with others too, Japan, Australia, so that we have joint exercises, joint training, um, multinational freedom of movement, uh, freedom of navigation uh, operations, then I think the greater the long-term commitment will be and the greater the impact. Um, although hard security is important for Taiwan, so too is trade. And I think the West could be doing a lot more to encourage more trade with Taiwan as, as a way of supporting it. The EU has been talking about a bilateral investment agreement with Taiwan now for about five years. There has been some low-key progress. Uh, there are several specialist working groups. There have been lots of technical studies. But the progress on a formal agreement has been zero. The obstacle is purely political. Until now, the EU has made it clear that it's not willing to sign an agreement with Taiwan before it's done so with China. And progress on that remains glacial. There's no reason why the EU couldn't move if it so wished to. And if it did in current circumstances, it would send a very clear signal to China. But Bob talked about the difficulty of coordination and getting consensus among the 27 EU states on this would be highly unlikely. But if we look at trade more broadly, there's a striking disconnect between what Western countries say in terms of supporting Taiwan and what they're actually doing, uh, particularly in terms of market access. And this isn't just the EU. The USA, for example, continues to insist that Taiwan should open its market to racked up and treated pork before it will discuss any of the trade matters. Japan refuses to talk about Taiwan's wish to join the new Trans-Pacific Agreement until Taiwan first lifts its ban on agricultural imports from Fukushima. So while I suspect that a joint approach towards a new multilateral trade agreement with Taiwan is too ambitious for now, um, perhaps the USA, Japan, the EU, other like-minded countries uh, could each pledge to take specific market access steps uh, with Taiwan as a way of boosting its confidence. But I'll uh, end with a final thought, which comes from uh, the former head of our intelligence service, a former senior diplomat, who early this month said that the best way of helping create a new common front against China would be new leadership in the USA. I'll leave it there for now. Well, thank you very much, Ambassador Rowley, for that, I think, very consummate sort of, uh, um, and comprehensive uh, diplomatic uh, uh, remarks that I think really included a lot of good observations and, and, and fast and very interesting points there that you made uh, and treating a very complex topic like parsing out um, you know European uh, perspectives uh, on on Taiwan and China in, in a manner that I think you know really helps to uh, narrow our focus a bit on really the importance of trade and and, and the challenges uh, of, of of trying to come to a more cohesive and coherent uh, response, as, as as Bob had alluded to, I think your point about uh, really about even how close of an ally that you know of UK is uh, to the US, how how still it is you know, difficult, and 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 there are divergent interests there, where the governments will take on you know different positions on issues that seemingly would that, that, you know there should be a common position on. Uh, because you know again there just there are, are there are different interests there, and uh, so this. This, uh, as we are trying to work towards, um, and I think we all probably agree that you know we need to work towards a, a more a, a trans a more of a transatlantic approach to these cross strait issues. We we do need to take a step by step approach and and really work on what is and really identifying first. I think what we do, what you've done beautifully is identifying what what those steps could be. Uh, what are what are some of the low hanging fruits? What should be some of the low hanging fruits uh, that we can take to uh, to really build a, a a more of a habit of cooperation on on cross strait issues and and uh, and I sincerely hope that um, that you know we can really continue this conversation uh, and that policymakers in 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 both the U.S. and and Europe and, and in Taipei are, are 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 listening in on this too, so that we can you know take you know measurable and, and measure steps uh, to uh, to increase coordination on this uh, very critical uh, sets of uh, of issues here. 
Um, next, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Teresa, who has the uh, very difficult uh, uh, task of trying to summarize the European perspectives <laughs> on cross-strait uh, relations. Uh, and uh, so over to you, Teresa. Hello, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm uh, delighted and honored to be here with this uh, esteemed group of uh, commentators. I am I have to start with an apology because my computer seemed to have lost the bandwidth and I accidentally signed out, so I missed the first comments, but I'm glad everything's working now. Um, I was given three questions to cover, and I've, I, I'm not sure if he said this in the opening remarks, but uh, just to reiterate that April uh, 2019, the EU came up with a white paper just prior to the EU-China summit, where they encapsulated the EU position on China as uh, a partner, a competitor and a systemic rival. And of course, the Chinese embassy spent about two or three days trying to parse out what systemic rival meant because they weren't really clear before they could actually respond. So that one sentence, those three descriptions, really shows how complex the EU relationship is. So I, we just had the EU-China summit uh, that was done virtually. Uh, it was postponed and it was just done uh, about a week and a half ago. And the outcome of that was that there was no joint statement there wasn't even a joint uh, press conference. So uh, if you take it as a barometer of current relations of EU-China, it, it's not very good. Uh, for example, uh, the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, stated uh, during the press conference, she called out uh, Beijing on the cyber attacks on hospitals across Europe. So this was a big surprise to everybody. So that was probably the biggest takeaway from this event rather than the actual meat and potatoes of the, the summit, it was actually what was reported in the press conference. And if you read the press statement from the Chinese side and the EU side, you would think they were on a different planet, that they completely had two different events. And the key ask of the Europeans was uh, the long suffering comprehensive agreement on investment, the CAI. And this uh, has been going on for seven years. They've had 29 meetings. Last year, they were able to sign uh, a joint communique because it was at the same time that the U.S. was having a trade negotiation with China. China wanted to show that they had other friends. And so the previous two years, 2017, 2018, EU-China could not have a joint statement. They were unable to sign or make any agreements. So last year was a really watershed year. At least that was the perception here in Brussels. They managed to sign a joint agreement. And that the CAI, there would be specific uh, progress made on that. So you can imagine everyone's surprise and um, in Brussels when absolutely no progress was made. Now, we know at the MPC uh, uh, back in Beijing, there was discussion about um, RECEP and also the CPTPP, two regional economic agreements in Asia Pacific. So you can see that for Beijing, the con the focus for trade agreements is really in their own region, whereas the EU trade agreements pretty much on the back burner. So China has everything that they want in Europe. They, Europe is open and it's easy for China. You know, in the past, they came and invested here. Since then, uh, since there's no progress being made, the EU has actually brought um, defense instruments. So they're becoming far more defensive and an FDI, a foreign direct investment screening mechanism has been put in place. Uh, strangely, only half of the EU member states had some form of a screening mechanism, so this is actually progress. But nevertheless, it was watered down. Uh, the, it's a bit toothless, and there's not an enforcement mechanism. But that does not prevent other EU member states from coming up with their own or tightening their own investment agreements. For example, Germany, one of the biggest economies and biggest trade partners of China, is fearful in a post-COVID-19 economic landscape that a lot of these companies will become, you know, be, you know, sale of the century. So they've created a fund to help protect their high-tech industries from buyers or purchasers from China. So each member state, it's up to them how they can protect their economy as well. And the EU, the commission has laid out some guidelines. So it's up to each individual member state to follow them and strengthen their own individual uh, defense instruments. So it's becoming more difficult for China to invest in Europe, but it's, one of the, the takeaways from this EU-China summit was that Beijing uh, does not want to see export controls put on high tech. 
So this is a, the U.S. of course expects the EU to cooperate with them on this. And um, when when we had the, the honeymoon period of EU-China relations way back in 2003, after the Iraq War, uh, where they were made a special comprehensive partner, uh, one of the two asks that Beijing had was to um, lift the arms embargo and also uh, to. Uh, it appears that we may have lost Teresa uh, due to the bandwidth issue. Um, we're going to try to get her to sign back in, and when she does, um, you know, we'll we'll let her finish uh, her her presentation. I think just to keep the uh, keep the train moving here, um, I'd like to turn it over to uh, to to Lai Yizong, uh to give us uh, his perspectives on uh, providing a Taiwanese perspective on transatlantic cooperation. Over cross trade issues. Uh, Ethan, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Russell. And uh, uh, thanks for inviting me to this very distinguished panel. And in this very interesting and uh, at this very interesting time for this uh, very important topics. I think when we talk about the cross trade relationship uh, and the cross trade uh, relation management, uh, in the past, uh, generally the uh, uh, the, the paradigm is always through the U.S.-China-Taiwan relationship. And then uh, in the past 10 to 15 years, we started to expand to U.S.-Japan alliances uh, versus uh, Taiwan-China in the cross-trade uh, scenarios. And I don't know whether uh, the current development will lead us to more of the discussion through the Quad in the uh, cross-trade relationship. But I think uh, that probably is uh, some of, the, uh, we saw some of the direction probably will lead to that. But um, uh, when we talk about the U.S. and the European uh, rela uh, uh, relation on the cross trace, uh, the so-called EU-U.S. Uh, Taiwan-China relationship, it does not seem to be that uh, that is actually there. Or basically, in terms of the security sphere, uh, the uh, EU-China, uh, EU-U.S. and China, that is uh, probably uh, not on the uh, radar on the cross trace uh, when we talk about cross trace relationship. So this is the the current stages, and I think in Taiwan, uh, the people in Taiwan they also anticipated that due to the uh, geopolitical realities that the United States uh, and Japan and probably the Quad probably will be uh, when uh, the security issue in Taiwan uh, cross a strait that started to uh, have some issues. The um, uh, it will be the U.S., it will be the Quad, it will be the Japan that probably will be the country most likely to respond, and. Uh, and only very few people will expect that uh, the EU will come in as a security uh, forces uh, in the scenarios. So basically, when we talk about the EU uh, in a cross trade relationship, it's basically anticipation of the Taiwan EU relation and or uh, how the EU could uh, play a certain non security role uh, in uh, help the balance uh, for the cross trade relations. And I would say that uh, with anticipation of those, uh, the um, um, the record on the EU on Taiwan uh, probably is not, does not show that much. Although a lot of people they talk about the uh, some of the economic progress, uh, whether the uh, the uh, the process for the uh, bilateral trade uh, bilateral investment agreement uh, that is in, in still in process, and also the recent uh, investment in Taiwan through some individual European member states such as the uh, Denmark or the Holland on the, uh, the uh, wind turbine that has been a, one of the biggest uh, enter, uh, enterprise investment in Taiwan in the recent years, uh, such as those. O of course, those are the, um, the price spot. But um, in terms of the whole uh, uh, advancement, uh, it just does not seem to be there. So this is just a, uh, to uh, echo what the uh, ambassador Mike Riley has said earlier, that uh, there are a lot of room that, that could go forward. But uh, we do not see that it's really uh, going in a full force. And I would say that uh, in, uh, of course, Teresa uh, earlier said, uh, talk about the EU and the United States. Uh, they're starting to have some converging view uh, about China uh, from the, uh, whether that's a partner, uh, that's a competitor, and especially the, uh, uh, the description about the systemic rivals. 
Um, yes, right now we do see the trend about the, the development uh, and the coming to uh, converging perceptions between the United States and the uh, EU, EU itself or the EU member states uh, regarding what the uh, China uh, as uh, what China should be. But uh, uh, we do not see the similar an attitude about Taiwan. So, or uh, to a certain extent that uh, um, uh, it does not seem to us that uh, there's a uh, uh, EU Taiwan policy. And so basically it's individual member states, uh, their own uh, responses uh, to a certain uh, scenarios. Or uh, when China uh, has something on Taiwan that uh, you will just left to the EU uh, member states uh, individually for them to respond. This is what we saw uh, as the situation developed right now. Um, and even with those, uh, about like uh, some of the uh, episodes in year 2018, such as Chinese uh, pressure uh, international companies uh, regarding the uh, uh, how they should describe Taiwan or how they should designate Taiwan, uh, and uh, other the diplomatic allies uh, competitions vis-a-vis uh, -vis Taiwan. Uh, the United States did come out, uh, whether in the uh, verbal support or even with uh, certain actions uh, uh, in year 2019 to help Taiwan to stabilize uh, its uh, diplomatic allies. But the uh, uh, EU itself or the EU member state hasn't really come up with any statement, let alone any actions on those. So this is uh, one of the area I think that uh, uh, when we compare the United States and the EU, even in a non-security uh, uh, area, that uh, the, uh, the differences between them uh, to the uh, to the general public in Taiwan, that is uh, very uh, significant. And add to another interesting uh, dimension in Taiwan, when the people talk about EU or some of the EU positive praise uh, on Taiwan, they come up with an issue like um, the same-sex marriage, uh, the legalization of same-sex marriage. And, uh, and also in the past that uh, the uh, Taiwan's continue uh, practices of the capital punishment uh, continue to be the uh, the problem between Taiwan and EU. So those are the issues, not about China, but on the universal value, or at least uh, political values. But uh, that uh, become, rather than a, an advancement, but also become some of the issue that started to uh, become the pro uh, become the public future problem uh, in Taiwan and the EU. And uh, uh, the reason I said that is that it started to get people in Taiwan start, uh, to compare about the EU's attitude toward Chinese pressure on Taiwan and the Chinese uh, human rights records versus vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the uh, EU uh, when Taiwan is under the threat. So they will co compare those two issues about the, uh, uh, the attitude from the EU on the capital punishment uh, exercised by Taiwan and the uh, uh, really, uh, silent um, action or the wording. Uh, regarding the uh, the Chinese uh, the uh, political campaign against Taiwan. So this is just a general public, some of the perception that started to simmer uh, around the corners uh, that I uh, observed so far. And I think uh, about the uh, uh, advancement on the EU and uh, the United States, about the cross relationship, especially on the uh, uh, Taiwan, I think there are areas that uh, actually we can uh, work on. First of all, uh, about the first of all is about the how to improve the democratic governance how to put taiwan itself as part of the when we talk about the global democratic governance problem and issues that taiwan can contribute and Taiwan could participate and this is the area that also matter very important in terms of taiwan domestic and political reform and as we started to move into the area with a lot of deep water and some of the reform that really touch on the nerve about the historical legacy in Taiwan itself, such as judicial reform, such as the transition of justice, many of those issues that the Taiwan uh, not only is in need of help, but also our experience uh, could be uh, a very important experience sharing uh, with the uh, other country, including European Union uh, member states regarding the democratic uh, governance. <clears throat> Another issue is that uh, how Taiwan uh, could uh, through the EU and the United States, come on uh, position and assistance uh, to place Taiwan in a map of the uh, global governance, uh, especially uh, uh, with the uh, pandemic uh, coronavirus uh, demonstrate so far that 
uh, we found out that the, the Taiwan uh, itself uh, could uh, be a, um, a valuable contributors. Uh, we are not the one that are requesting help, but that we can also uh, be helpful to others. Uh, and the Taiwan is willing to help. And I think it is important to how to uh, consider uh, when we have the global discussion about the global governance that uh, uh, Taiwan could uh, feature in in those discussions for the Taiwan's experience or Taiwan's uh, shortfalls and even our advantage could be uh, incomparable uh, with others in the same stage so that, that we could then actually participate and uh, contribute. Now, the third thing is that when we talk about the value uh, issues, I think the, in a competition or the, the issue caused by China regarding the global uh, governance models, the uh, uh, pandemic uh, issue in Taiwan, what demonstrates is that the Taiwan is providing a, a counter uh, argument uh, against Chinese uh, assertion that the Chinese authoritarian model is the best one that could respond to the pandemic uh, problems. Um, because Taiwan is a democracy, and uh, we are actually uh, the way that we are doing this is try to uh, maximize uh, the uh, democratic governance. But of course, uh, with um, with a certain uh, development of the uh, technology and and our uh, citizens' conformity uh, with the uh, norm, and also the uh, the importance of how to build the trust uh, of the governments uh, that is also important. And uh, this probably will provide uh, for both the democratic system as well as the, the global uh, narrative campaign against uh, the authoritarian uh, narratives. Uh, they, uh, that could uh, also serve a, a good tool for that. Uh, in terms of the democratic governance, and that is the improvement uh, with the technology and uh, the kind of the trust issue that should be there uh, um, and feature in a discussion when we talk about individual rights. Uh, that is part of the, uh, uh, for some uh, democratic system that they probably feature that some, that is some of the problem that holding back again, uh, against the government's uh, uh, battle against uh, this uh, pandemic. So the, uh, I think the Taiwan particular cases uh, could be a, a very important uh, lessons that uh, can contribute. And, and for Chinese, I think the uh, Taiwan being not only in proximity in China, but also we are sharing a good deal with the Chinese culture that we're able to do through the democratic governance uh, to respond to the uh, pandemic uh, in comparison with Chinese authoritarian model. That uh, not only uh, is a very good rebuttal, but also can demonstrate uh, the kind of problem within the uh, authoritarian and what kind of alternative that could uh, coming out of the so-called the, the Chinese civilization uh, in uh, a, a different uh, political system that could come out a, a different political trust that could come out uh, with this to respond to the uh, Chinese authoritarian narrative campaign. So I think the uh, the EU and the United States that about the cross the issue, some of the uh, features that a Taiwan could and actually be in uh, has been rather underutilized. Uh, how the, uh, uh, the 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 EU and the US uh, when they look at the crossway issues uh, through uh, some of the uh, uh, the so-called non-security, but uh, nonetheless, it's also very important in terms of norm-forming issues. That is uh, another important area that we could uh, feature the uh, cooperation between the EU, uh, United States, and Taiwan. So I just stop here. Thank you very much. Yizong, thank you very much for that. Um, uh, I thought very interesting uh, discussion there. Um, I think I was particularly struck uh, and found it, you know, interesting revealing of the nature of you, uh, Taiwan and EU relations when, you know, you pointed out that, you know, the pressing issues that are being discussed in such dialogues between the two sides center on issues like capital punishment and, you know, other issues of same-sex marriage. It, it sort of highlights the nature of that relationship when in fact, you know, obviously there are these uh, other also uh, a number of hosts of other issues that, that, that could be and should be um, not to make any light of those other issues which are important, um, but, you know, on the, especially on the security front and non-traditional security front, uh, challenging the, 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 uh, the, you know, the sort of the issues of democratic governance. And I, and I think that's an area where, where there is a great deal of opportunity uh, for the United States, Taiwan and Europe to be working more closely together. And, and I, you know, and I'm, um, I find myself to be sort of the 
you know, unofficial uh, promoter or <laughs> cheerleader for the uh, the global cooperation and training framework. But I do believe that that is a, a very, um, you know, useful mechanism that started back in 2015 uh, between the United States and Taiwan, where the two sides were able to host dia um, dialogues inviting um, uh, partners from uh, across the region in a in, in a workshop forum to really uh, help build capacity of uh, partner countries in areas where Taiwan excels in, in, in areas of, of, of human rights, women empowerment, of energy, of, of health, public health. A lot of these workshops were centered on public health and, um, and, and more recently focused on uh, issues of democratic governance. And, and in particular to note is the, um, is the uh, uh, on media literacy. And there's been two such forums that have been held now in the past two years on media literacy. And, and I would just add that that this Sweden uh, I was one of the coordinating partners for the media literacy forum held last September. And it just, and, 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 and Japan um, has joined as a coordinating partner, an institutional coordinating partner for this dialogue. And, and I don't see why, you know, why couldn't a, a European country you know, join uh, perhaps as a coordinating partner of an institutional coordinating partner uh, in, in in such a dialogue that could you know could really uh, I think help to elevate um, uh, you know really the asset uh, and, and capabilities that Ta that we all know Taiwan can bring to bear in in a host of international issues, but are but is prevented from doing so because of of China's political uh, uh, political uh, clout. And, um, and and so I would just point out that I, yeah I think it's um, you know you, I think you raised a lot of good suggestions there and that, and I think um, you know hopefully we can pick up on some of that uh, either in the discussion or or follow on in the um, uh, in follow up dialogues on on, on this topic um, but I like we have to reset back now so I do want to give her an opportunity to to finish her uh, her remarks um, and um, so uh, oh, back to you Teresa. All right, thank you. Uh, we have heavy rain here in Brussels today that sometimes creates problems for the internet. I'm very sorry about that, and I'm very sorry to not have heard what the original speaker's comments. I hope I'm not duplicating any of their remarks. Um, so I'll, I'll keep it short and sharp now. Uh, the three areas I want to emphasize now on EU-China uh, relations and the strategic triangle with the U.S. So Beijing's strategic uh, statecraft in Europe, in Europe the, neutral, the effective neutralization of Europe, and uh, the variable geometry that we can use as a transatlantic approach. So under Beijing in 2008, uh, th there was kind of a sale of the century. They, they increased their investments dramatically in Europe, and that also not only in companies, but also in strategic infrastructure. And so we saw increased political influence. And so at least Europe is now more aware of that. So this economic statecraft is very useful because in an organization of now 27 member states, all you need is one country. To, to say no when you need unanimity. So it was quite interesting what we saw um, yesterday at the, the Foreign um, Affairs Council that was held. Of course, the, the usual suspects were Greece and Hungary who were watering down and preventing any sort of action by the EU in regard to the national security law in Hong Kong. And there is a lot of talk and people recognize that. And I mean, I was I watched another webinar recently and the head of the EU delegation in Hong Kong was a bit cranky about feeling they were always that the EU was always being criticized. But, you know, dialogue and, you know, one week ago, they had another um, Foreign Affairs Council meeting and out of the 27 EU member states, only one country, Sweden, put possible sanctions on the table. All other 26 did not. So this is kind of a barometer of uh, expectations in Europe. They know the post-COVID-19 economic landscape will be difficult. They do not want to alienate China. And so Sweden has a, a very different economic relationship with China. So in, in one respect, they could possibly afford not to worry about how um, China treats them. And so uh, we find this kind of um, perception that China is the, the future for them, that it's the economic future. It might be you know, we've already reached peak China, some economists would say, but there is definitely a perception on that. And the way the U.S. is handling the COVID-19 pandemic also reinforces this idea that the U.S. will be hobbled, that their economy will be hobbled, and that 
Europe uh, perceives that there will be growth in China and so the future will be in China. For example, we saw not one, but two planes full of German business people going to China to make deals. And this is part of what I wanted to talk about the fragmentation narrative. Uh, Europe, uh, China has realized that the most important country for them in Europe for their strategy is Germany. So they have kind of a special relationship with Germany. Germany clearly is the largest trade partner uh, with China and you know, high technology equipment and mechanic, mechanical equipment is part of their trade. So the fact that China deliberately cultivates Germany, uh, so most EU policy really goes through Berlin first rather than through Brussels. So this was a clever approach by Beijing to cultivate good relations with, with Germany and that helps set the economic agenda. Um, I'm just gonna give you a quick readout of the countries uh, that support it. So we only saw out of 27 EU member states, only 15 um, voiced criticism of the new security law in Hong Kong. And some people would think, oh, there's a north-south divide or east-west divide. It's all over the board. So it's not easy to say which countries would go into the China basket and which ones won't. And others change and move around, for example, Italy. So we see that Italy has rejected Huawei, and they also signed on for the Belt and Road Initiative. So it's, it's very complex and it's difficult for, for China to manage. Uh, in addition to this kind of economic statecraft, we saw uh, the introduction of the 16 plus one, now known as the 17 plus one sub-regional grouping that China has carved out of Central and Eastern Europe. And you know some of these member states in Central and Eastern Europe, so it's 11 EU member states, five possible accession states. And it's in a very strategic area. So Mackinder, you know, the great geostrategist, would say that you know he who controls Central and Eastern Europe controls the world island. So they've been studying the Mackinder, and they really have a lot of influence in that region. It there is promise fatigue. Some countries expect it much more from China, but in reality, China doesn't need to spend a lot of money to get the influence that they want. So, for example, Hungary, um, India is a bigger investor in Hungary than China. Yet Hungary will always kind of do China's bidding in regard to policy or to, to stop policies that Beijing does not like. And we just saw this happen yesterday. So Greece also has um, uh, Piraeus port, which Beijing uh, Chinese companies have invested in. They've modernized it. It's actually quite a uh, productive and highly efficient port. So now they have a land sea corridor through from the Mediterranean all the way up to the Baltic. So no one really saw that one, you know, it was done incrementally, but this has really been an incredible move, I would say, by, by Beijing. So we have this kind of economic statecraft that's been extremely uh, useful uh, for China. And this also creates a neutralization of Europe. So we saw yesterday was the anniversary of the arbitral tribunal uh, decision. And if we recall what happened four years ago, there were three member states, Croatia, Hungary, and Greece, uh, who watered down uh, and the statement. So instead of welcoming the arbitral tribunal decision or supporting it, they just really acknowledged it. So that's in diplomatic speak, that's the lowest possible thing. So in my analysis, Europe has been effectively neutralized since 2016. And I should add that Croatia had uh, a maritime dispute with Slovenia. And so that's why they didn't want to be part of the decision. Uh, but Hungary and Greece, and the more countries that China can pull into their orbit, it's easier for them. No member state likes to be alone and they feel all the pressure. So the more countries that China can pull into their orbit, it is easier than for them to say no. So, um, so this effective neutralization of Europe, we saw that four years ago and it continues. We've seen uh, human rights statements blocked by Hungary. We've seen um, the statement on the, the lawyers that were uh, imprisoned. Uh, the EU was unable to do that because of Greece. So we see really, the things that the EU says that they value human rights, so that they have this uh, voice in the world, for the last four years, they've been effectively neutralized. So to, con um, so to conclude, <laughs> so uh, the work on the FTA, uh, the, uh, the hope, the dream of the EU having some sort of an economic agreement seems to be falling by the wayside. I think uh, after seven years of China holding out the carrot to them, I think people are really disappointed and discouraged. Uh, and so, oh, I had something here about um, positive and negative. So in transatlantic relations, we really are seeing a crisis here. And it's not, uh, the previous speaker, I, what I did here when he said that, he gave the great example of the AIIB, the Asia Investment, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. So it's not just with Donald Trump. We saw a huge running to join the AIIB, even though the US had lobbied against their allies not to join. 
And so it's not just with the Trump administration. There has been this um, tectonic shift in how Europe perceives China and that you know, this is the future. Maybe they're taking the US for granted, but anyway, there is a tectonic shift uh, happening in relations. So we've seen the EU describe uh, the US, in, they put the US in the same basket as Russia and China. So I've never in my lifetime seen transatlantic relations in such bad uh, condition. So, um, so the US position is quite clear. And we've seen uh, Pompeo, uh, Secretary of State Pompeo had a meeting, uh, a virtual meeting with Borrell. Uh, the Europeans asked for another meeting. So this is what you know the European External Action Service as a bureaucratic institution for them a success is having another meeting. We even saw under the Obama administration, they were trying to curtail the amount of meetings. If you look at how many China has, 70 meetings a year with the Europeans. So they really have a lot of dialogue. And the, the Americans almost feel that they don't want to get sucked into more meetings with them. But it's a good sign, I think, that um, Pompeo reached out and accepted Borrell's suggestion of this structured dialogue. And uh, yesterday in Paris, there was a meeting with Matt Pottinger and O'Brien uh, in person. They wanted to do it in person rather than virtually because they felt they could do much more effectively in person. So it's interesting that the EU, the, this structure was not the EU, it was the big powers. So you have the UK no longer a member of the EU, France, Germany, and Italy. And I think that kind of variable geometry is much more effective than working through with the EU right now. Um, and now we have the German EU presidency. So the, the third point I want to make, oh, I did talk about the special relationship with Germany. And Germany has actually been quite disappointed because Angela Merkel coming to the end of her very long reign as chancellor had envisioned the Leipzig summit that it would take place in September. Xi Jinping would come to Europe. All the EU member states would meet and it would be this grand statement of EU China uh, getting along and, and the signature on this um, investment deal. But that has been postponed because of COVID-19. Also very bad optics considering what's happening in Hong Kong. And I think that it was just a good uh, excuse to say it was because of COVID-19 because it would really uh, be bad timing. The next leader of Germany will really set the, the stage for the, the next state, phase of uh, EU-China relations because perhaps Merkel, who's been in power for so long, doesn't want to be shown to be, have made a mistake. I mean, when facts change, your position should change. So there's still this kind of very pro-China position. She was in Wuhan a year ago working on uh, exchange. She wanted to see German industry work technologically with, with China. So there's this fear that Germany could be trapped if they don't uh, extend economic relations with China and, and get on that kind of high tech train together. So I would suggest um, that in transatlantic relations, there are three things that we can really work on is techno technology projects, especially in 5G and 6G. We've seen even with Nokia and Ericsson, uh, a lot of those things are produced in China. So China can, can prevent those things to be exported. So this is an issue if, if a EU member state chooses one of those uh, companies for their 5G and China won't allow them to export the equipment, then they're really in trouble. So I think we need to come up with a better and smarter strategy. And um, the, the challenges in the transatlantic relations quickly, WTO, uh, Paris Agreement, and the JCPOA. And, and of course, finally, uh, burden sharing. Now we're not even talking about burden sharing any longer. Uh, people are talking about burden transfer. And this is a big issue now with COVID-19, there won't be uh, much of a budget uh, to spend on defense. So the whole narrative of the US is that we have big problems in Asia Pacific. We need you to pick up you know, your burden and, and spend and take care of your own region. And so I feel that uh, Europe has been kind of sitting on the fence as a, an earlier um, speaker had mentioned. Uh, they don't want to have to make a decision, but there really is clear need for Europe to pick up and not even burden share any longer, but burden transfer. The US needs Europe to really take care of their own neighborhood. So the op so uh, opportunities would be a coalition of democracies. We see IPAC, it's this group of parliaments from around the world connecting democracies. So I think this is a positive development. And you know, in, in Brussels, there is very little debate within the think tank community. It's almost that uh, this kind of feeling of 
it's going to happen. Just go along with it. China's the new great power, and economically, we have to just work with them. So there's this almost defeatist narrative, which I find extremely worrying. So I would suggest trying to, you know, come up with better strategies. But you know, we really have to counter this defeatist narrative that's very prevalent here in Belgium. And I, you know, this idea of the dialogue of democracies, you know, coalition of democracies balancing uh, China's influence, and um, you know, Europe, there are certain things that Europe has learned. You know, the U.S. can say things to them and they might not hear them. But the, the current situation with wolf warrior diplomacy really, I think, showed Europe kind of the arrogance um, Beijing had towards them. We've seen, you know, we've got a gun for my friends and a uh, gun for my enemies and wine for my friends. We're criticizing the Chinese ambassador uh, said that the French were leaving their old people to die in nursing homes and you know, even kind of making threats in the UK about Huawei, if they didn't uh, embrace Huawei, there would be a blackout. So I think Europe is coming to their own conclusions on China and they had to learn that on their own. So hopefully uh, they will wake up and that uh, transatlantic relations will not just be repaired with, for example, a new US president. I think Europe really, the ball is in Europe's court and they have to decide where they are. I mean, they're kind of, kind of, floating around in this, like, we want autonomy, we don't want to make any decisions, but they really have to make uh, a concerted effort, and the U.S. can no longer carry the burden in Europe. So uh, whether Europe remains a transatlanticist or becomes post-American depends on Europe's leaders. So that's where the ball lies now. Thank you. Wow. Uh, wonderful, Theresa. That's that's excellent. I think you, you you made a lot of excellent points in there. Um, the one that really sticks out is really just as much as we need coherence and cohesion in the transatlantic relationship, uh, perhaps European cohesion, and and, and 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 avoiding the fragmentation that you are that you've highlighted is also critical into ensuring that there is a a, a more concerted uh, uh, counter uh, to China's influence operations. Uh, in, in Europe, and uh, and so maybe perhaps you know some of the the, the policy recommendations that may uh, what the United States could do, or uh, is to try to help encourage some more cohesion among Europeans with regards to their China policies, uh, policy towards China, and 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 of course uh, you know to uh, with, with with Taiwan um, as well. Now, I just a reminder for our our live audience members um, that we will uh, open for audience Q and A um, for the last uh, well, probably around ten minutes of the of the session. Um, I will pose a few questions right now for to to exercise the moderator's prerogative. Um, and uh, but you know, just as a reminder, you can submit your questions either using the chat function on YouTube um, or by uh, submitting a question to contact at um, globaltaiwan.org. Now, I, I want to get into uh, a, a perhaps a, a rather um, somewhat sensitive uh, topic here, um, and, but this has a lot to deal with with, with Taiwan. Um, and, and I think you know, we've touched on a lot of the broader sets of issues that, that do affect UE Taiwan relations, but I think this really strikes at the heart of it. Um, and I think we've highlighted you know, to, 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 to a good extent that you know, individual European countries do have Good ties with Taiwan, shared values, and 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 um, and there are a lot of um, you know sort of positives in in the relationship. Uh, but as much as there has been a lack of action taken, there seems to also be little inclination on the part to of European countries to press the boundaries of individual countries' uh, one China policy. Um, so, what would it take for European countries to really examine uh, its one China policy? Um, and I pose these questions. Obviously, this is uh, there's, you know, there's not one set European, one China policy. Uh, but I, I wouldn't want. I want. I do want to pose this question to to perhaps Michael Riley and then also Teresa uh, on how you think you know different individual countries, one China policy have adapted uh, or became uh, or, or uh, has uh, adapted in response to. Uh, what we're seeing from China. I mean, I think in many ways in the United States, the US one China policy has demonstrated its elasticity. You know, in many ways, it has shown that there is a lot that can be done with Taiwan still, even under the rubric of a of a of a US one China policy. And I just haven't seen that sort of similar sort of adaptation in the European context. And I wonder to what extent you see that there is or maybe I'm missing something. So 
Uh, over to you, Michael, uh, or Teresa, whoever want to take it first. Um, Michael, perhaps, if you want. Okay, um, let me give it a try. Um, I think, sort of digressing in a sense, but as a way of approaching the, the answer, one of the biggest problems that European countries face, and not just European countries, I think it's applicable to most of the world in their relations with China, is this fear of China um, among their own policymakers, among their own bureaucrats. There is this very strong assumption, which I've certainly come across among uh, European Commission bureaucrats. I've come across it with my own former colleagues that you can't do this because China won't like it. I've come across it in my current uh, academic position, this um, sort of fear that you know, there'll be a bad reaction from China. This, to me, has been a great success of Chinese diplomacy. Predates Xi Jinping. But they've convinced the rest of the world that if you do something, China's going to react badly. Um, and the first step for any country, and this includes Greece, Hungary, all the others, is, look, they've got to really uh, have the courage of their convictions and be willing just to actually take moves. Um, there's a, a recent book come out in Australia, I've forgotten the name of it, but it's by Clive Hamilton and a German colleague, but it's looking at the extent of Chinese influence. They make a very good point about the extent to which, and, and Bob may disagree with me, because I think the US is different here, the extent to which so many diplomats based in Beijing um, there's this conviction, if you like, in their capital was that only a diplomat who, quote, understands China can go there to represent the country. Well, by the time they go back as an ambassador, they've been thoroughly imbued by the thuggery of the Chinese foreign ministry. That Their default position to uh, head office is you can't do that because China won't like it. I I've, I've dealt with this. I mean, at a personal level, the UK lifted its visa requirements against Taiwan. I had three years of people in London saying, we can't do this, there would be a really bad reaction from China. I said, where's your evidence? Uh, give us the evidence. When we actually did lift, there was no reaction. And once we did, actually the rest of the EU was very happy to follow suit for the same reason. They saw there wouldn't be a reaction. And we really just need people to be willing to do this. China, to be fair, has made its red lines very clear. So there's a lot more that European countries, other countries could do without actually in, in the dealings with Taiwan without actually going across those red lines. But we've got countries like Spain, which uh, in many ways I think is worse than Greece or Hungary. We've had Spanish universities refusing to have Taiwanese fairs because some junior diplomat in the Spanish embassy in Madrid has phoned up and complained. But you know, the university should just tell them to go away. Um, this is, I think, the first step. Let's get over this sort of um, self-abasement in front of China. Now, moving on to what can they do in terms of the one China policies. I think part of the difficulty is that there isn't such thing as a one China policy. Every country's one China policy is a little bit different. And undoubtedly, some of them in Europe very explicitly recognize Taiwan as a province of China and therefore are more inclined to take a pro-Beijing line. Um, but at the other extreme, I don't think, I think Germany basically doesn't take a position on this. The UK's position, although it's not publicly stated, is very clear that the UK does not recognize Taiwan as part of China. Um, but nonetheless, Publicly, it's hard put at time. It's hard at times to see a difference between the UK position and um, other countries. The Netherlands tends to, I think, by and large, be the, one of the more proactive ones. Um, they've had Chen Shui-bian when he was president, having stopovers in Amsterdam, for example. Oh, we've seen Copenhagen host a visit by Joseph Wu, the foreign minister. Um, I think the real challenge is to get, I think it's too much to expect the whole of the EU 27 to act in concert on this, but there are sufficient countries within the EU who are like-minded. So Denmark, Sweden, for example, Finland perhaps see things similarly, the Netherlands, 
if countries can at least do things in collaboration, it makes it very much harder for China then to try to pick them off. And that's what I, I think they should be doing, rather than sort of looking at the detail of their own one China policy. They should just be talking to neighbors and saying, let's do this together. Um, we might see more progress then. Teresa, do you want to make sure um, that, that was an excellent uh, point. Uh, and, you know, if they could speak with one voice, can you imagine if you could get all 27 EU member states to speak with one voice, China would just have to accept the position. But instead, China has, you know, divided divide and rule, and he has, China has each member state kind of like, pick me, pick me for that investment or for this project. So you're right, uh, you know, this is the base, uh, this is the, the nub of the problem. If they could finally just all agree to speak with one voice, there, was, there would be nothing China could do about it. But instead, everyone is jealous of investment or favor with China. So this is the problem. And your idea of this variable geometry um, this is the problem, especially in foreign policy. It's not seen as an EU position then. So you're right if some of them are strong and, and, and you know, work together. But even, for example, Norway, uh, when it had awarded uh, Lu Xiaobao the Nobel Peace Prize, it's not an EU member state, but it's also part of the FTA. But instead of kind of showing solidarity, the EU could have showed solidarity. For example, they've complained that, you know, Scotland took over the salmon exports to China that Norway once had. So there's really a lack of solidarity across the board when it's seen as economic uh, opportunities in China. And, and I haven't seen a way around that. And I think it's becoming even sharper. It will be more sharp uh, with the, the decline in people's economies post COVID-19. So I, I think China has really made the calculus and decided we can be as rude as we want. No one's gonna care and they want our money, they want our investment. Um, and I agree with you about the fear factor. We just had an, uh, a recent example of the head of the EU delegation for the 45th anniversary of EU-China relations, you know, writing a rather anodyne, you know, let's hold hands and sing kumbaya, and all the 27 uh, EU member state ambassadors had signed off on it. But there was one sentence that talked about the origin of COVID-19 being in Wuhan, that we should all work together and, and uh, improve the World Health uh, System. And it had to be removed. So instead of uh, talking to the other e EU member states, the head of the EU delegation just decided to self-censor this and without even getting the permission from the EU member states and signed off on it. And so instead of even, they, they thought that they would get it published in the People's Daily uh, to, to a broad audience, but instead it was just published in English in the China Daily. So even though they self-censored, uh, the head of the delegation didn't get anything out of that except a ticking off by the European Parliament who wanted his resignation. So I understand now he's on a very tight leash and um, this is what happens. It's kind of this uh, capture of these diplomats. He had been to, to Beijing on several other diplomatic postings. He's a French diplomat and now he's been parachuted in as a head of the EU delegation. So you do see this fear factor that I know China and I know this would upset them. So I will, I will make the decision on behalf of everyone. Um, and then let's remember, you know, China needs Europe as well as a market and Europe has more leverage than they think, but they're always kind of fearful. And I really agree with your point that it's so difficult to get over this fear factor and that uh, people do self-censor, people uh, behave in such a way as so as not to potentially upset China. So China doesn't really have to even make too many red lines because member states will self-censor to prevent anything like the anaconda and the chandelier. So in that book that you were talking about, I understand it was like a mini earthquake in the UK calling out the names of uh, naming and shaming um, people who've been uh, described as useful idiots of Beijing. I, I think it's a hidden hand, but we have seen um, closure of uh, Confucius Institutes in many EU member states. So there is a backlash and there is growing interest uh, in, in somehow countering Beijing, but I'll leave it at that. Oh, and one final point, especially for Taiwan, uh, um, Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission, there was a really interesting uh, situation because it's not just China with their mass diplomacy and a lot of the equipment um, that they had exported were it was a very low quality. And then Taiwan had exported all these and gifted uh, aid, uh, masks, high quality masks to Europe, which were so greatly appreciated that Ursula von der Leyen wrote a tweet thanking um, 
Taiwan for for this much needed help and how how grateful they were. And of course, it's irritated Beijing greatly, but it's the first time we've ever seen, you know, the the president of the European Commission kind of uh, thank Taiwan in, in that fashion. All right, it's not a it, it was a tweet, but still, I, I think it was a, quite a, a good sign of of um, Taipei's mask diplomacy. Thanks. Now, I have plenty of questions I want to ask our, our panelists, but I do want to give our, our audience members an opportunity to have their questions presented. And, and we've received a few um, of those questions. And so I'm going to present uh, these questions from our audience members. Uh, the first question is from uh, Tina Chung from the Voice of America. Uh, her question is, China's hardline approach to Hong Kong caused a lot of concerns about the future of Taiwan and possible conflict in the Taiwan Strait. With the PLA military activities getting more aggressive towards Taiwan, is there any message that European countries, other allies of the US and like-minded countries can send uh, to help ease tensions? So I, I open this up for uh, the, the panel to, 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 to answer. Uh, anyone would like to take a stab, first stab at that? Bob, perhaps? Make sure to unmute yourself. Oh, sorry. Yep. Mm -hmm. Not so much what the U.S. might do, but clearly, I think the U.S. is is sort of stepping ahead. We saw that more recently, for example, the sending of two aircraft carriers uh, mm -hmm. to the to the region. I think, at least under this administration, with Pompeo and others. Uh, I think the U.S. will respond. Uh, I think more more forcefully. What the next administration will do, I don't know. But I think generally it's shifting. The question now is whether the Euro Europeans. Uh, Tina was asking uh, how the Europeans might re respond to this. Mm. So maybe turn it over to Michael again, if you'd like to. Okay. Well, if I got the full question, it ended with uh, what can they do to help ease tensions. Um, right. And I think the $64,000 bit of that is, well, would more security activity in the region by Europe ease tensions or inflame them further? Bearing in mind that Europe has not been involved in security in that part of the world really since the end of the Korean War, or certainly since the UK uh, handed over Hong Kong. So, uh, as I said, I mean, the UK and France are increasing their um, ship visits in the area, their freedom of navigation operations. It's modest. EU, the EU has made statements about Hong Kong. Um, maybe they're seen as being insufficient, but nonetheless, I think there is a degree of European solidarity on that. Um, the only way really that tensions are going to be eased is if China itself backs off. So the message from Europe has to be back off um, rather than sort of going in there with a gun and threatening China, it seems to me. Now, is China going to heed that message? Well, only time will tell, I think. Uh, there's no short term answer on it. But so far, what we've seen from Xi Jinping certainly is um, he's not inclined to wind down the tension. Um, he seems to think he can go further. Teresa, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, well, we have the numbers. So 15 uh, at the UN Human Rights Council, so 15 EU member states supported it. 12 did not support it, including Bulgaria, Croatia, Greece, Hungary, Italy, Malta, Poland, Portugal, Romania, Spain. So there's 12 countries that did not support it. So the EU is deeply divided on this. So that's why we get these watered down. The only thing they came up with yesterday at the Foreign Affairs Committee is that they will promote um, scholarships so students can come here and study. So I think that uh, you know the EU is fond of dialogue, but I think in the court of international opinion, which I think Beijing is concerned about, this type of figure where the EU is divided right down the middle almost, it's not sending a very strong message. I would have liked to have seen something far more strong, especially with other democracies in the region. Maybe that would have gotten Beijing's attention, but they cannot count on them. So the EU needs um, some diplomatic Viagra, <laughs> they need a little more than what they have. And they, they really should punch more above their weight, but there is this fear and no one wants to upset Beijing these days. 
Thank you. Um, I have a question from a from a colleague, uh, and this is for uh, Dr. Light Zone. And I think Bob, maybe you can, or Ramira, your your our European friends uh, can can add in their, their perceptions from Europe. But for Dr. Light, do you feel that Taiwan's position in Europe has been strengthened by the pandemic? Has medical diplomacy been an effective tool for international engagement? For you. Yeah, thank you. I think the um, uh, to a certain extent, uh, it did uh, raise the Taiwan's profile within the European uh, member states and uh, probably EU institution is, uh, itself. And also, it raised the uh, popularity uh, of Taiwan among the uh, uh, EU uh, general populace. So, yeah, in in that regard, yes, it sort of raises a little bit profile. But uh, I how that translate into the uh, uh, the real uh, diplomatic actions i think that still remain to be seen we see some ups uh, such as just uh, teresa just mentioned earlier about the eu uh, commissioners uh, express public uh, thank you to taiwan which we never seen that before so that's the first time but um, um we also saw uh, some of the eu member states such as germany uh, when they talk about the uh, the the mass diplo uh, the the mask the donation from Taiwan, they would not uh, even utter the uh, the name of Taiwan uh, in their uh, public um, uh, 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 expression about appreciation. So yes, uh, to the extent that uh, I think there's an up and down, but I think uh, I also like to add something that uh, both uh, Mike Riley and uh, Teresa uh, said earlier about the question to them. I, uh, the, about the European uh, member states, their uh, engagement with Taiwan, some of them, uh, and the action is actually, uh, actually better than the United States with Taiwan. Uh, just if you just look at it in terms of the level of the uh, officials visit to Taiwan. Uh, for the United States, that uh, any people around the rank, above the rank of the assistant secretary, that's considered to be a very big deal. But uh, uh, we saw already uh, uh, several EU member states, their vice, for, uh, vice minister or even ministerial levels visit Taiwan, even publicly. That has been go going on for decades or even uh, much longer. And uh, just as uh, Mike Riley has said earlier, that uh, not a lot of uh, the strong reaction from China and uh, some of the EU, EU member states, such as the, uh, formerly the UK, uh, they have the vice for, uh, the vice minister come to Taiwan, and I think people probably remember during Eastern, Eastern 15 or 16, uh, he visited the Taipei City Mayor Cohen at that time. So that also that, that was one of the visible ones. So I think the uh, uh, when we talk about uh, the so-called One China policy, definitely different country within the EU member state, uh, they have the different definitions. But the, a, a lot of them is actually the how the practice define the One China policy. And the uh, the kind of the practices is uh, the definition power is actually resides within the EU member state their own, and uh, how to really utilize and realize that uh, you have this as a leverage, and I think that's an important uh, issue uh, for our European uh, friends uh, to really uh, appreciate. Mm. That's excellent, excellent point, uh, Dr. Long. I think. You sort of the, the practice and how the, the practice defines the type of the definition. And I think what you know, Ambassador Riley was been mentioning earlier was that, that fear has sort of you know have have been have created the self-imposed restrictions that even the policy itself perhaps does not necessarily um, uh, uh, pre uh, proscribe or, or prescribe. Um, the, the Mike, uh, Mike, Michael, Teresa, do you have anything to add to with regards to European perceptions of Taiwan's medical diplomacy? I know we were, we basically already um, went over our time. But with the uh, with our panelists, um, you know, permission, I, I do want to give them a chance to make some concluding remarks uh, and and perhaps respond to this question. Anything to add, Mike or Teresa? Um, well, not really. I mean, I would just endorse all that that's been said. It, it, it has been positive for Taiwan the the medical diplomacy. The unfortunate reality for Taiwan is that essentially it's a small country of twenty three million people next to. 4 billion people, it's got to be able to be doing this sort of thing on a daily basis all the time. 
just to keep on or just to get onto radar screens in European capitals. It doesn't have the same huge resources China does. So it's just a constant fight for it. But I would just say, don't be dissuaded, don't be discouraged. This has shown what Taiwan can achieve in terms of impact. Carry on doing things like it. Thank you. Teresa? Mm -hmm. Uh, and endorse everything he says. I'll just make a quick comment that um, it really showed that Taiwan was more like Europe than the PRC is because uh, after Beijing had sold a lot of this aid, they requested endorsement letters from these countries saying, thank you so much, you did such a great job. And Taiwan, of course, didn't do that. So I think the Europeans were, first of all, surprised at Beijing's efforts to get them to sign these letters. Whereas when Taiwan gifted this kind of very high quality aid, they were seen as more like Europe. So there seemed to be a commonality there, whereas, you know, this idea of like almost going back to school, I need a little letter of endorsement from Beijing saying how great, you know, thank you for the masks, whereas uh, Taiwan, everyone's like, those are the most valued masks in, in Brussels, for example. Um, and I have to make a comment about the Czech Republic. So we see how complex relations are. We have Zeman, who's actually very pro-China, but then the, the mayor of Prague, there's the famous story of how you know, like the ghost of uh, Havel uh, is there. And it's this kind of inspired um, support of democracy. And we see the, the Prague kind of uniting and becoming a sister city uh, with Taipei. And so uh, this is incredible. And, I, and so this sound shows how complex and multi-layered the relations across Europe are. But I think that um, the Prague, Prague mayor is actually quite an interesting story. That's a, a side, uh, segued away from medical diplomacy, but the mass diplomacy, I think um, people did appreciate it in, in Europe and it did get recognized and it normalized Taiwan. It made them seem more like Europeans, I think. Mm -hmm. Bob, uh, any sort of final thoughts? And perhaps, let, let, me, let, let me leave you with, with, with this question for you, Bob. Uh, and this is from a colleague. And then I think this is really uh, also a, a central um, point of our discussion today, which is on, focused on transatlantic approach. And, and Bob, so the question for you is, what sort of policies then should U.S. policymakers be pursuing to best support a transatlantic approach to cross-strait issues? With the last word, Bob, you the last word. Okay, and before I answer that specifically, just very quickly, uh, my own thinking about this is, there's a Chinese saying, an ancient Chinese saying, uh, uh, it means if you keep on doing bad things, at, at the end, you will destroy yourself. And it's an old, old Chinese saying. And I think it's a story of empires, story of empires that's, that overstretch and all that. Uh, at this point, clearly, China, which is that some people still find it in their interest and so on. but. My bet is that China in its current regime will continue doing many things that eventually will impinge on the interests of Europe, of other countries, of the United States, of et cetera. And at some point, the interests that are impinged will be so wide and so strong that there will be a stronger backlash. At this point, I think it's, it's uh, countries are still undecided how to respond. But I think down the line, uh, as Unfortunately, I think China will continue to expand given its China dream and so on. At some point down the line, I think it's it's already becoming clear, but at some point down the line, it will become very clear, hopefully not too late uh, for a response to that. As for the U.S., I think uh, in response to the question, I think this administration, following administrations, our think tanks and others have, I think, become have begun to really recognize what China's threat and potential threat could be, and how serious it is to continue to respond on our own. And I think Michael is right. At the end of the day, in Asia, in with Taiwan and China, U.S. initiative will be key. U.S. leadership will be key. And I think uh, I think that I see that the there's been a really tectonic shift in terms of how we view China and its threat to the liberal international order and our interests as well. And so I think we need to make sure that people are aware that we go to Europe as O'Brien and Matt Pottinger and in the future others will do to try to carry this message and uh, increase awareness. And, and then, of course, try to coordinate action uh, in different areas. Oh, thank you.
very much, Bob. And uh, obviously, given the importance and the complexity of the issues that we are tackling today, we could really go on for 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 hours, if not days. Uh, you know, really part you know, tackling uh, addressing all these issues. But we have exhausted all the time that we have, and I do apologize to audience members for these questions I have not been able to get to. Um, you know, uh, please, uh, you know, um, uh, go on. Uh, the video will be available online, and uh, and I hope that you will uh, join us again for for our next event. So. Thank you to all our presenters uh, very much for your thoughtful, uh, your comments and insights. Uh, this will certainly not be the last uh, of these types of dialogues that we will host uh, by the Global Taiwan Institute. Um, and, uh, and we look forward for, to you uh, joining our next event. Uh, thank you all, stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you.